Huh. All right. Hello, Samuel. We're going to talk today about the New York Asian Film Festival, which you are the executive director of. That, that's the correct that's title? That's yet. correct. I'm the festival director. It's just Festival you know, director, executive yeah. director. Okay, okay. A little interchangeable uh, title. But first of all, um, tell me, did you enjoy yourself at the Cannes Film Festival? Did I enjoy myself in Cannes? Uh, yeah. To an extent I did, but <laughs> I think for people like me, uh, it's, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's fun. You're in the sun, you're by the uh, croisette. It's kind of yeah. nice, but I have to say, uh, for me, usually that's the last leg of programming. That's really where I book the last few films. I uh, We review them with my colleague, Claire. When we're there, it's just quite busy and not necessarily like as fun or glamorous as it may seem because we spend a lot of time inside the palais running from one place to another. Right. Uh, so that's good for exercise because you walk up and down <laughs> those uh, alleys and all that. You're always late for meetings because wow. these days security in the palais, the palais is the, the place uh, you know, where all the market takes place. So that's really what can is for for a lot of industry people. Yeah, like from the outside, you see the red carpet, the gowns, and the, the the vanity fair out there. But for a lot of industry professionals, the reality is quite different. Uh, you have uh, the the deals at the cafe and so on. But you could be the worst place to be doing that, you know. So <laughs> right, you're not in a war zone. Do you know what I mean? So that's yeah. it's it's pretty decent. It's a pretty decent place to do. Uh, to do business at. All right. Well, uh, I think that's an interesting <laughs> insight right there. Um, what movies did you enjoy at the festival? Uh, well, I think that the, the hot ticket uh, this year for Asia was really uh, Walled In, Twilight of the Warriors, Walled In. I'm getting confused because honestly, I've been following this movie for a long time. I'm talking about Soi Chang's latest. Okay. Uh, it was long called, uh, it, it had a bunch of names before. So now I'm having trouble catching up with a recent uh, transformation of the title, whatever. You know what, I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. So Chang's latest film, Walled In, Kowloon City. Twilight of the Warriors, Walled In, Kowloon City. W whatever it is now. Do you see what I'm talking about, Michael? I think, I think so. I think so. so some of the titles, uh, I kind of, they, they get mush, mushed up in my mind and I, I forget Forget everything. Well, that's the martial arts uh, epic that's set in Kowloon Walled City, you know, that, that gigantic slum that was the most dense uh, populated area in the world. It was destroyed uh, quite a while ago. I don't remember uh, the exact date, uh, over 30 years ago, maybe more. So in the, in the 80s, it was a den of crime and like it's impossible to go in. It, it was sort of a surreal uh dystopia except it was real and uh, of course they, they cleaned it up so all kinds of uh it was like a place of ultimate anarchy you know so uh perfect setting for <laughs> you know uh for a great martial arts slash triad movie so that was a pretty hot ticket in Cannes. uh i caught it there it was fantastic uh, it'd be distributed in america and it'd be our closing film so I can tell you, I can tell you that. So okay, that's insane. Yeah, it's pretty insane. That's like action nirvana, basically for Hong Kong action fans and hopefully others. But very, uh, yeah, really exciting film. Very, very, very fun, and probably one of the titles I'm most excited about. All right. So I would love for you to tell me a bit about uh, various countries' entries at the New York Asian Film Festival. Uh, please tell me about some Japanese movies. Oh, so the the in terms of the Japanese movies, I think we have a really good. I think overall it's one of our strongest lineup. I have to say, obviously, I'm biased, uh, but particularly this year, I mean, we have a great balance of action drama. Uh, it's very diverse, and yet I think at at, at some level very coherent. So for Japan, we have what I'm uh, most excited about. Some of the period pieces slash fantasy movies we have, we, we're showing something called Bushido. That's Kazuya Shiraishi's uh, first uh, foray in Jidaigeki. It's his first period piece. 
Mm. Uh, it's a really exciting piece, completely different. I think it really injects some new blood in the samurai genre. Uh, it starts off as a very quiet piece, uh, which is weird for him because he's been known for making ultra violent, pretty messed up Yakuza films before. And like all of a sudden, you have this movie that's very quiet, you know, like a period drama where people are playing Go. And then, of course, the souls come out. So it's a very schizophrenic movie, quite unusual. And I think I'm very excited about showing this one, see how the audience responds. Gorgeous cinematography, just an all around like, great movie. Uh, we have something called Yin Yang Master Zero, which is a great reboot to the um, the Omyoji franchise. So pretty famous franchise about uh, Omyoji, you know, the Heian era. Uh, basically, it's like Taoist magic. Uh, yin yang magic you know they do that stuff it's like it's like Doctor Strange but real oh. <laughs> not normal like oh, Doctor wow. Strange particularly the imagery is heavily borrowed from uh, Japanese and Chinese yin yang uh, sorcery and magic so uh, back in the Heian era the classical period in Japan they had uh, such sorcerers right so there was a huge hugely popular and critically acclaimed manga back Oh, I don't want to say something wrong, but I think in the 90s, lasted for quite a while. It has all kinds of awards. They first made a, ver a film version of it with um, Nomura Mansai. Uh, it's it's okay. I mean, it's classic in its own right, I guess. Uh, landmark. I think it's aged kind of badly, but the, the reboot is really, really like kick-ass. Very, oh. very cool visuals. Uh, all around fun piece, really gorgeous to look at, just mesmerizing, really. And the uh, lead actor would be there. Uh, he's actually going to be there mostly for his new, uh, another franchise called Kingdom, probably even more famous. It's uh, the new chapter, chapter four is coming out. Massive, massive movie, like all, all the films are, uh, did really well in Japan. So number four is coming out and be receiving the best from the East uh, award, which specifically uh, honors uh, recent great performances of the year. So these are some of the titles I, I like. Uh, in competition, we put a movie, uh, a pretty complex psychodrama called Ichiko, uh, quite a dark piece, completely the complete opposite of the Kingdom 4 and Yin Yang Master or World End. Really serious minded, uh, quite, yeah, serious headed drama, uh, very dark, but at the same time, I think also quite uh, hypnotizing at some level. Really fascinating watch. So I think it's, uh, yeah, so we don't do boredom at the festival, I'd like to think, but so these are all, I think, great pieces that I'd like to highlight for Japan only. Yeah. yeah we, we have a lot of stuff. Tell me about the Chinese movies now. What are what are some uh, exciting titles to look forward to from China? Uh, China, China, mainland China. So again, a lot of things. Um, so we have the world premiere, the international premiere, international premiere of a film called The Escaping Man by mm -hmm. uh, Wang Yichun. This is a film with uh, a filmmaker with champion. Uh, so that's her second film, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, incredibly masterful direction. Uh, a very unique filmmaker. It's really great. It's, basically, it's a story of like basically a group of losers, kind of like people who are just really not smart. There's this guy who got out of jail. He's kind of a dumbass, but they're very, it's <laughs> very endearing characters. They make a lot of mistakes. So, so he pairs up with a kid who's sort of like the village idiot. I mean, he's not a village idiot, but like not too bright, not a kid who's going to go to a great school. So it's very endearing to see these tales of people that were struggling to just live, you know? So at some level, it's um, um, it's uh, it's a very serious story. It, very, it feels very real at the same time. Uh, it has some magical realism elements. It's a very heartwarming tale with some hilarious moments. 
So it reminds me a lot of a certain kind of, um, that's a big comparison. It reminds me a bit of what Bong Juno does in terms of bending and blending genres together. And you, you remember how, as again, maybe not the best comparison, but remember how Memories of Murder from like mm. over 20 years ago now is, is this really unique blend of com black comedy and very, very dark thriller, right? So Wang Yichun, I think, kind of at some, at, at her own level, I think she's great. She she does something similar, but it's, but it's very Chinese too. So you have some recognizable Korean influences. I would say she would admit to that. And uh, something very Chinese to what she does. Uh, so that, that to me was one of the best films I've seen and it beat competition as well. Uh, other than that, you want to hear more about the Chinese films. Uh, there's something called uh, A Long Shot uh, that's set in northeast, east, northeastern China. Uh, I mean, on the surface, it's like, you know, like a social critique kind of. Uh, basically, like it describes like the poor conditions, blah blah blah. Factory workers, it's never great. Factory worker, you don't necessarily have you know, a luxurious, comfortable life. I think it's a uh, it's a fact everywhere. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think the US is doing particularly great with our working class workers. So that's interesting because there's a universal dimension to it. There's a historic dimension to it because it's said. In the, in the 1990s, a period of rapid fire economic growth where people, you know, the country didn't care about what was going on with uh, the less fortunate. So, so there's that. And again, it's, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it's a blend of genres. So it's that, you know, like, okay, it's tough to work at the factories, but it's also a crime thriller because the main uh, character is this guy who's a former professional sharpshooter. But he lost his hearing and a bit of his edge as well. And it's his story and how he, tr he tries to bond or in a way is reluctantly, reluctantly forced to bond with his love interest son. So it sort of has a father-son uh, relationship exploration at its core. And it's a bit similar in that sense to Escaping Man. So I don't know. It's interesting because when you when you make this, when you start, when you program these lineups, you don't necessarily themes. Every year people ask me, what's the theme? And I'm like, how the fuck am I supposed to know? I just start right. to <laughs> And it's pretty bizarre. Whenever people ask me that, it's like, how would you think that way? I, I don't know what's coming out. I'm just, yeah. basically, the when you, when you get started, my year starts in October, programming year in September, October. That's when we start reviewing the films. Mm -hmm. By July, some of the films are old in terms of their lifespan in the life, in the festival circuit. You know, that's, that's the thing. I mean, festivals is, is about, uh, the festival world is about discovering films, about premieres, a bit silly, premiere status, but it's about finding something new. So a uh, film you're going to like in September, you know, by January, like, I don't remember what it was, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it doesn't feel fresh anymore. On the other hand, you have stuff, you're like, Jesus, this is like I watched it yesterday. Okay. So that that's really interesting. And, and you'll see themes emerging until much later. And then, like, I was just doing editing the blurbs, writing last minute, you know, movie descriptions for program book and announcements and so on. Then I realized, oh, that's really interesting. And now, as I'm talking to you, I'm realizing a bunch of the films have this sort of uh, mother, uh, mother, daughter, father, son exploration. That, that is new. I wasn't thinking about that before. That uh, that's quite interesting how, to see how convergences emerge. It's like as if in some regions or around the world, some themes emerge. I remember two years ago, a lot of films were like basically that that if they had any statements to make, uh, I don't think films should have a statement. But overall, the, the overall the message you could get from maybe half of the lineup, maybe twenty of the twenty of the sixty or seventy films we showed two years ago were well, basically, well, the rich suck. You know? <laughs> it's like, rich people are fucked up. And I was interested, that's interesting because you could see 
You could see that in the West as well. That was the year of, if I'm not mistaken, Triangle of Sadness, mm -hmm. Glass Onion, and all that. A lot of movies basically satirizing and making fun and taking aim at uh, the, 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 the 10%, the 5%, the upper 5%. Mm -hmm. So you would see that in Asia as well. Uh, that was that was quite interesting to me. Huh? Maybe rich people just said enough of that. We're not going to finance movies that uh that shit on us. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe just... that's happening. I don't know. Finance folks, you know, it's a different universe. That's why film is so exciting. It's a convergence of so many so many different uh, jobs and interest uh, and politics. You know. Uh, a lot of folks who are, are into uh, funding movies, they're not necessarily the most progressive. On the other hand, most film industry creatives are quite progressive. So yeah. it is like a, a total mismatch. But somehow, out of that mess and out of the conflicts, you, you make, you know, a 90 minute, two hour, you know, journey into something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that uh, that that merging, the synthesis. It, it, it both crowds the the financiers and the progressive uh, filmmakers. Let's say, like broadly speaking, maybe they resent each other, but they need each other. So, you know, yeah. hopefully they realize that eventually. Yeah. Well, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. Probably not. Yeah, uh, that's sort of uh, idealistic thinking. So tell me about the South Korean movies or some of the South Korean movies that are played. In. Uh, that's a very interesting case. Yeah. Very interesting case because everyone's saying, oh, wow, so I'm of Korean descent. I was born in Korea. Uh, right. Uh, so, of, of course, I have a, in a sense, I have a vested interest in my uh, right. native country, right? Um, so Korea is a very interesting case uh, because as a topic of conversation, obviously, Korea is hot. It's red hot right now. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. K-pop K -pop has gone global. Uh, K-dramas, Korean dramas on um, Netflix Global, they, they're like the most watched uh, stories. I mean, uh, globally, I guess you could argue. Uh, and they've gone mainstream. Um, the same is not true with films. And overall, I think the Korean entertainment industry has fared very poorly and for the film industry it's having it's basically having a near death experience. Oh wow. So there's a lot of caution happening. Uh it's hard to find it's hard to find good Korean films. Oh uh, quite simply commercial cinema is not that exciting any longer. Having said that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I don't believe in in statements like oh these days everything sucks. Right. You know, right. if you're a decent programmer you 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 know you take a close look there's always interesting films coming out from like the horror genre, low budget, unpredictable stuff. So that's what happened this year. Uh, we found uh, great movies from unexpected places, different companies, different sales agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are opening with a Korean film. I really did not expect that. For a long time, I thought we were going to open with a Japanese title. Mm -hmm. uh, they decided to wait for Venice. I think they're wrong. Uh, but I think it was a blessing in disguise. We found a very, very fun comedy called Victory. A uh, very heartwarming tale. Just it's like a feel great movie. It's basically it's set in the 1990s. The lead, uh, the lead actress is uh, E. Hedy, best known as Hedy from Girls' Day. It's a former. Uh, former K-pop idol. Uh, I think she's making quite a, an impression in that film. Uh, so it's set in the 1990s, a small town Korea down south. If you speak Korean, everyone speaks in this really heavy uh, southern dialect. It's kind of funny. It's just, it sounds very feisty. I don't know what to compare it with. Maybe it's like a southern role in a way. Quite different from the Seoul dialect, uh, which is sort of like the dominant uh, accent or way of speaking. So basically, uh, it's about having big dreams in small town Korea. Uh, it's about these girls who are like not interested in studying at all, and they don't have much hope of ever getting out of that uh, that 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 place where they live in, right? And they decide to form a cheerleading group. Uh, what the hell is cheerleading? 
And so it's a snapshot of 1990s Korea and a portrayal of uh, a coming of age story. Uh, I thought it was hilarious. Really one of the films I enjoyed the most, just as a pure level, on a personal level. Yeah. I, I wasn't thinking, oh, this is going to appeal to so-and-so. I was just like, this is really fun. We should show it. I just don't see how anyone with a pulse would dislike this. It's, it's, it's just incredibly likable and enjoyable. Sometimes that I like to think we choose films on a formal basis. We appreciate, we try to appreciate films as objectively as possible, evaluate them objectively. But they also sometimes, you know, you're not a robot, right? right. So <laughs> you watch, I watched this film, I was like, I think it's the human, the real human being in me was like, this is just fat, fat, fabulous, you know, just a fun ride, right? And you suspend everything else in your head. You're like, okay, there's no stakes anymore. It was an, uh, a market screening. It's a really great movie. That's what we're opening with. Other than that, uh, yeah, there's some unexpectedly brilliant films, highly unusual. We're showing something called The Tenants. Very, very bizarre film. I don't know if it's a horror movie. Like, mm. it has like some elements of Cronenberg. Uh, it's basically based on a. Um, so basically, uh, it's really hard to rent or buy an apartment in store right now. There's like okay. this cycle of booms and busts in real estate is quite it's quite tricky you have to pay uh uh basically a wide load of cash up front which is highly unusual system they do something similar in in japan as well so you all of a sudden you have to come up with fifty thousand dollars out of nowhere okay right it's like it's, it's institutionalized bribing in a sense uh so it's a satire of that system basically it's set in a world where you can rent your ceiling you know, to to increase your revenue and make the rent more profitable. So basically in that universe, uh, you have folks living in the ceiling. So that leads to unfortunate consequences. There's a bit of Shallow Grave in that. It reminds me of the, the plot in Shallow Grave. That's, a, was it Danny Boyle? Yeah, it's Danny Boyle movie from like 30 years ago with Ewan McGregor. He has a little bit of that. He has some, it's very Kafkaesque quite absurd there's a dude at some point who rents the bathroom and he's wearing this strange hat totally bizarre messed up character and there's and his wife doesn't really speak she mostly squeals it's a super strange piece but quite unique i felt i felt like we have to show that kind of weirdness like belongs in the in the festival you should show we should show something like that as well it's quite bold very very different from anything you see on the big screen coming from the U.S. or Europe right now. All right. Well, yeah. one thing I've enjoyed over the years, because I've been covering your festival since uh, 2019, uh, I love I love finding, um, you know, discoveries from countries I know, like, very little about, such as Malaysia or Bhutan and even uh, Kazakhstan. So tell me about uh, those kind of discoveries people can uh -huh. have at the festival this year. Uh, that's a little more rare this year, but like uh, yeah. from Central Asia, sadly enough, there's that's our limit. I was it I, was the stuff we watched from Mongolia. I have to say, wasn't very very convincing. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, from Southeast Asia, there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's we have some great Indonesian horror. Uh, okay. We have the international, the North American premiere of a film called Respati from Indonesia. Uh, it's classic, classic Indonesian horror. Uh, that's not a genre, that's not necessarily uh, something that Americans know very well. So mm -hmm. I felt like we had to introduce uh, the genre of Indonesian horror films uh, to America. Uh, one of the pieces that I enjoyed the, that I thought find the most exciting is also something we put in competition uh it's called snow in midsummer it's just malaysia taiwanese co-production uh pretty incredible movie very classy art house piece uh that's focused it's very KL, very kuala lumpur not sure how to describe that movie either uh it's quite art house but in a way that's very accessible that's something i i, I believe we do well uh, I think you find in international film festival circuit 
sometimes you find very very pretentious shit like glorified <laughs> glorified slideshows and the likes so I, I try to avoid those you know movies where like you you watch basically laundry drying in the sun and i'm not kidding because that's <laughs> actually the first five minutes of the film i've seen this year i was like holy shit is that a joke <laughs> so well i mean i don't know it's just some people enjoy that so i shouldn't dismiss those but uh i i think i'll i mean i'm getting into more general considerations about the festival about what we do but uh, i like to think when we show out house it's still strongly based on the strength of the storytelling the story has to be accessible so that's something uh i believe uh i take pride in uh, in any case, so yeah, we have some some really different things from Southeast Asia. I have a great stoner comedy. We have a great stoner uh-huh. comedy from the Philippines called "When This Is All Over." It's pretty hilarious. So it's set, it's set during lockdown time. You, I, I was my colleagues were like, "Who wants to watch another COVID lockdown story?" But I was like, "This is just really fun." So it's basically set during the so that you know it was during the Duterte regime. So not exactly the softest, uh, most <laughs> progressive regime on earth, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, you have this guy, it's just this drug dealer, <laughs> this sort of, you know, just kind of a teddy bear, but he sells uh, weed uh, and other stuff too <laughs> to the resident. He's just stuck in that condo. Uh, so at, at some level, it's just like this dude who's trying to eke out a living, just make it through the day. And still earn a living. So he sells he sells dope to people. Oh. Uh, so that's pretty hilarious. You never learn his name. So that's pretty oh. interesting. They just call him, Are you the guy? And I was like, okay, that's just great. It like so they just call him the guy for hours. Like, hey, <laughs> you're the guy. He's like, yeah, I'm the guy. And so, but another level is also social critique. Uh so basically as you go up. You go up and you go down. So at the top of the condo, at the top of the apartment complex, you have like the ultra rich, like just kids getting stoned all day, well, <laughs> desperate, just desperate to have a very decadent, drug fueled party. So I just don't know how to do it because there's rules against social gatherings and it's against the law. So, but they don't care about the law. They think they're about the law. But as you go down, you have like the maintenance folks. You know, people really struggle. Uh, so there's there's a critique of that as well. Uh, so that's yeah. Again, it's a genre blending, bending. Uh, but it's 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 a really fun ride. Very fun ride. It has elements of euphoria. It's 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 not half as dark. It's you have none of the like the depressing shit from euphoria. And I, I really did enjoy euphoria, but it's uh. Yeah, it's quite uniquely Filipino. At the same time, there's a social critique dimension and the stoner comedy aspects that I think everyone everyone can like and will like, I hope. Oh, it's certainly what I want to see. Um, I yeah. enjoyed um, the the Yenbo Pin honoring five years ago. He got the, uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award at the New York Asian Film Festival. So who's getting the honor this year? Okay, so for Lifetime, we have a seasoned veteran from Hong Kong. Uh, his name is Taibo. He's not necessarily someone whose name you would recognize so easily, but I think he's been in everything. And in his latter years, he's really shining. So we have, uh, we're showing again as part of a filmmaker in focus about Ray Yun. Uh, he's an LGBTQ plus director. Uh, he makes stuff that I think anyone regardless of sexual orientation, can watch. Hmm. Uh, so Taibo, a couple of years ago, was in a film called Suk Suk. Uh, he got renamed as Twilight Kiss. And he plays he plays a guy who's like, yeah, sexually, I don't know what, how old he is. And he gets into a secret liaison with another man his age. And they, But the, 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 the twist is they're both married. In theory, they're like, but, you know, in Hong Kong, uh, same-sex marriage is not possible, right? And same-sex mm-hmm. relationships are frowned upon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they have to hide it. But at the same time, they really want to come out and just live the way they are, mm-hmm. right? So so in, uh, in recent years, I think Taibo has really particularly been impressive. 
in his performances. And we wanted to uh, honor his body of work in the Hong Kong film industry. Uh, for oh, we have Heidi, I mean, she was fabulous in that film. And I think her movie career uh, might really take off after this film. Uh, it's really fun. I think she has a unique on screen presence. Uh, that's a rare quality. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a limited pool of talent, but at the same time, it's also quite crowded. Uh -huh. I think she's really gonna stand above the rest after after this film. So Heidi was the Screen International Rising Star Asia awardee. Uh, we're having Nick Tse for a brand new film. Nick Tse of uh, I don't know what he's. He's been in a lot of stuff. He's already, he's getting to his 40s, interestingly enough. Uh, so he's like a new leading man. So in a sense, he's been around for a while, but mm -hmm. he's coming back to the screen. He's, he's been in a very popular, long running uh, cooking show. He's got, he has this cooking company. Uh, he's immensely popular in China because of that show. Uh, but he's making a return to the action film genre and he's, for the first time, he's been, he worked on the action choreography uh, of his uh, new film. It's called Customs Front Line. He will be on US screens uh, after uh, after our screening. Uh, so Customs Front Line, directed by Herman Yao, who's had a long career as well. Oh, uh, I love Ebola syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy, you know, outrageous stuff. Really outrageous yeah. stuff, <laughs> but also some... Great action film, category free horror. So he covers his career and his filmmaking spans a ton of stuff and several decades of, uh, of Hong Kong genre cinema. Uh, other than that, uh, we have the Dan Craft Awards for Excellence in Action Cinema. Uh, would be going to Hugo Sakamoto uh, for his franchise, Baby Assassin. I think he really revolutionized the hitman comedy genre in Japan. He basically almost invented it in Japan. Uh, and also he brought a complete revolution to stunt women work uh, in Japan as well. At a time when the action genre is not ne necessarily at its best. Uh, mm -hmm. But he, we thought he really stands out. So those are some of the awardees. Uh, of course, the closing film World Den is... Uh, is a no-brainer, but like giving them an award for great action cinema is a bit like saying that Mozart was a genius in music. You know, I felt that was a bit <laughs> so, yeah. so. Yeah, those are some of the people we have. Uh, we have a lot of great guests. Not everyone comes because they're getting awards. Thankfully, oh uh, I think it's a bit silly when you distribute awards. So like, Everyone's winning. Here's a <laughs> here's an award, and here's an award. And here's an award. Yeah. Uh, so Ananda Brigham is also coming. Uh, Ananda was uh, became famous, I guess, in the West because of Shutter, one of the best horror films of all time from the past 20 years. Uh, he had a really terrible US remake. Uh, but Shutter is currently being restored on 4K. Unfortunately, I don't think it would be ready until probably next year, the, the restoration, I mean. Mm. Uh, what else? Uh, among actors, we had Bill Kane, uh, the biggest, currently the biggest Thai star, a lot younger than Ananda, but for his generation, by far the biggest star. He'll be coming for a film called How to Make Millions Before Grandma Dies. That's the absolute smash hit in Southeast Asia right now. He did uh, it's the best performing, most popular movie in Thailand. He beat records in Singapore. In Indonesia, that's a big deal too. Is actually, we always had people who don't necessarily know Indonesia, but like this is a country of like 250 million people, 270 wow. million. It's a really huge country. So being a, a hit you know, in, in Indonesia is not a small thing. Believe me, it's one of the fastest growing uh, theatrical market in the world. Indonesians love movies. I think it's oh, yeah. a place to really watch. Uh, for for uh, in terms of quality, uh, it's very mature industry. Lots of great commercial cinema. A lot of horror, uh, but nice. definitely I think it will. I think it will diversify in the future. Uh, among filmmakers, uh, it's an interesting year because I realized with my colleague last night when I was going over the blurbs, we have like twenty 
new films, first films, I'm like, wow, it's a lot of uh, new discoveries. And it's really interesting. So a lot of first time filmmakers, they're just as good as the veterans. You know, it's interesting. <laughs> like sometimes you're young, well, not necessarily young, you can make a film. That's the beauty of filmmaking. Some people start in their 40s, 50s, I don't know. Yeah. And like, bam, the film's just, like, just as good as someone who's worked in the industry for 20 years. That's really interesting. Very weird phenomenon. So sometimes just the energy of uh, the director just brings something new. Maybe the team they gather, I don't know. There's a power to, to, to emerging filmmaking that I didn't realize. Uh, so yeah, that's an interesting year in this respect for uh, feature debuts. A uh, very good year for that. All right. Well, we're, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time, Sam. I, I talked a lot. <laughs> yes, we Sorry. did. It was very talkative. No, I All enjoyed. Right. It. it was very, uh, very informative, and I highly recommend people check out this film festival. It's what I look forward to cover, covering virtually, but still, I look forward to it every year. Yeah, go to nyff.org if I can plug that in. Yeah. nyff.org, yap.org. Uh, and I hope to see some of you at the festival. <laughs> <laughs>